come, oh come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That mourns in Our reading is taken from the third chapter of Acts, and I would invite you to respond with the uh, indented dark type. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. are sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Father, thank you for this word and for the fulfillment of what you spoke so long ago and for the coming fulfillment of that which is yet undone. Oh Lord, may our faith be strong to hear, to receive, and to live according to your word. And Lord, now the offering that is received, we ask your blessing upon it, upon every giver. We ask God that you would multiply these gifts, use them to touch hearts, and turn people to the living one who offers them eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to jump right into the meditation. I know you've got a scripture reading listed here, but I'm going to use those, that reading from Deuteronomy in the context of what I, the words I'm going to share with you tonight. So um, we're not skipping it, rather than just repeating it twice. Uh, we won't read it formally ahead of the message. Um, we have, I have chosen, I guess I should say, to use these four Wednesday nights in the season of Advent um, to look at four really prominent covenants that are in, in the scriptures, um, which were made between God and man, and, and I've called them, I guess, the, the, the four great covenants. Last week, um, we opened by looking at the Abrahamic covenant. And by the way, the reason I am focusing on these is because these covenants of God are part of his eternal word, and they are a foundation which he has been establishing in in the bringing forth to completion his plan that he has for this creation. We're not just set loose here to see what happens with us. We're not a grand experiment on God's part. He had a plan from before he created the earth. You're part of it. These covenants are part of it. Even though they were spoken to Israel initially, they wouldn't be in God's word if they didn't speak eternally to all people who are of his creation. So that's why we're looking at these. Um, how does that connect? What does that have to do with Christmas? It has to do with Advent being a time of preparation. And in my heart and mind, I believe that understanding what God is in the process of fulfilling is a really critical part of being prepared for his plan for our individual lives as we go forward. So that's my rationale in this. If any of you are wondering what does any of this have to do with Christmas? Um, so we looked at the Abrahamic covenant, and here's what we discovered last week from the Word of God. It was, first of all, and most importantly, an everlasting covenant. 
God said. The covenant he made with Abraham was everlasting. He said, I, and these are his words from Genesis 17, verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. Okay? We also learned that this is an unconditional covenant with Abraham. Uh, in other words, the outcome of the covenant is not determined by any human being's faithfulness. It's only being determined by God's faithfulness, right? And if you remember, the ones entering into this covenant were required to walk through the severed halves of several animals that were laid out, and then you walk through the middle of them. And the meaning of walking through those dead animals, cut animals, was the message of those entering into the covenant. The same thing has happened to these animals. May that happen to us, to me, or to you, if either of us should break this covenant. I mean, it was a serious thing. Um, so to make sure, it, we said this is an unconditional covenant. Do you think God's going to really, if he says this is everlasting, how can he make it unconditional if it involves human beings who have already experienced the fall? Right? I mean, that's a pretty risky thing, you would think, if God were going to do that. But as you remember, he had a way to make it an unconditional covenant. Um, he put Abraham into a deep sleep. And what did he promise him? Before he put him to sleep, he said, first of all, Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. It's going to be remembered for the rest of history. I'm going to make of you a great nation. You are going to have descendants that number as many as the stars in the heavens. Abraham didn't have even one child yet by, through him and Sarah at this point, you remember. Um, and he said this, all of the land that I'm going to give you of Canaan, and he spelled out the boundaries, all of the land is going to be your land as an everlasting possession. That's, that was all part of the Abrahamic covenant. So that leads us then into the next covenant that we're looking at tonight, the Mosaic covenant, because as you know, it was Moses who brought Abraham's offspring out of Egypt, and, and, and he took them just to the point, all through those 40 years in the wilderness, just to the point of entering into the land of Canaan, the promised land. But as you remember, Moses was not allowed to go in, um, which is an interesting, when you think about what picture is God painting here, we talked about those kind of pictures last week. Think about this. Moses represents what? The law, right? Is the law going to bring you to the promised land? No. So, do you know what Jesus' Hebrew name was? Yes. Yeshua. Who brought them across the river into the promised land? One whose name was exactly in the Hebrew the same, Yeshua. Isn't that interesting, how, how God paints that picture back even in the Old Testament? The law doesn't bring you to heaven. Nobody's going to get to heaven by keeping the law. And, and Moses for God to establish that point. Personally, on a human level, seems like a big sacrifice. But God was doing something more than one person's life here. He was, he was sending us a message. So before we look at some of the specifics um, of what God said to Moses in this covenant, we need to know that uh, a major distinction between this covenant and the Abrahamic covenant that we looked at a week ago uh, is that this covenant with Moses was not an unconditional covenant. Okay? The promises were made on the condition that Moses and the people of Israel would be and would remain faithful to what God commanded them to do and how they were to live. And in the first two verses of Deuteronomy that are listed here in your bulletin that we haven't read yet, we learn how God established the ground rules of this covenant. Listen to it, to the words. He says, And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I'm teaching you, and do them, that you may live, and that you may go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, your, uh, that the, Lord the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. So why was it so, what, what was the, what was the uh, 
the condition, if you do this, then what? Then God said, well, you would not only move into the land that I promised to Abraham, but you would be allowed to remain in the land, to remain there as a people. And God was, was really emphatic on this warning that he gave through Moses. He said, don't add a single thing to it. Don't take a single thing away to it. Don't reinterpret this. Live by it. Because your remaining in the land is dependent on you following this word that, I, that I'm about to give you. Uh, so why would he be so emphatic? Because the consequence of not being, not living by it carefully would be severe. And that's what God explained to them later in Deuteronomy 4. And I'm, well, I was going to paraphrase it for you, but let me read it beginning at verse 25 to 28. And, and God is looking now, he's, he's really giving a prophetic word here through Moses to Israel. And he says, when, your father, when you father children, and children's children, so he's looking out into the future here. And in fact, it's into the distant future from Moses. And when you've grown old in the land, if you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything, and by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God, so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but you will be utterly destroyed, and the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you'll be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone and the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But, and then listen to this. This is, this is an amazing uh, truth. I mean, that warning, we know what happened, don't we? with Israel, before I finish this passage. We know what happened um, from this side of history, exactly what God warned them, and it was really a prophetic message telling them what was going to happen. Um, it did happen. They were kicked out of the land, in fact, more than once. And you know the whole the Old Testament history where in 722 uh, the northern kingdom of Israel was taken away from the land, brought into captivity by the Assyrians, and then the southern kingdom of Judah, but, uh, a century and a half later, 586, they were taken captive and out of the land by Babylon. And that's the whole time of Daniel and, and that whole time. Um, the most consequential judgment of God upon the people of Israel, though, wasn't the Assyrian or the Babylonian captivities because they were allowed to come back. God was so patient with them. He gave them so many opportunities, and when they were in such trouble, they would cry out to him, and God would forgive them and bring them back. But the most consequential took place when God, according to Galatians 4.4, in the fullness of time, sent forth his son born under the law, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. When that happened... And he lived on the earth for 33 years, and he spent the last three of those years teaching them about the kingdom of God and the importance of repentance and what God was doing. And they rejected not only the message he was proclaiming, but they rejected him as God. They rejected him. And their temple in 70 A.D., was utterly destroyed. And you remember Jesus' tearful words at the end of his time of teaching when he tried over and over, and there were some, certainly his disciples and others who were followers and who accepted it and believed it, some on a surface level, some at a heart level, some turned away, some were committed for life. Um, but his own tearful words as he rode into Jerusalem to die, he said to the leaders of Israel, would that you, even you, even you leaders who are going to be so influential in the, his, in the future of this nation, even would that you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. And Jesus went on to describe the complete demolition of the temple, which was their pride and joy. 
as part of the consequence of their rejection. And he says it was because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. God sent forth his son, came to his own, what does John say? He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Because they rejected him, this, this of the most serious of all judgments. And Matthew records Jesus saying, see your house, that's what they called their temple, your house is left to you desolate. And from 70 AD till today, they haven't had a temple in the land. Um, and then Jesus says something interesting. And this is what goes back to the words of Moses 1,500 years earlier. Now let me finish that passage in Deuteronomy 4. So Moses is looking ahead. He's looking to the time when Israel is carried off into the nations. He's prophesying this. And he says, from there, from that context where you are scattered around the world and left few in number, serving other gods, from there you will seek the Lord your God and will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in tribulation... All of these things, and all these things come upon you in the latter days. You will return to the Lord your God and obey His voice. For the, and listen to this. For the Lord your God is, mer is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that He swore to them. Which covenant do you suppose He's talking about? The Abrahamic covenant. Yeah. God said, even after all of that, when we're getting right to the end of the age, I'm not going to forget that covenant because it wasn't based on Abraham's faithfulness or Israel's faithfulness. It was based on my faithfulness. And Jesus, as he rode in, as he wept because they didn't recognize the time of their visitation, he said, you won't see me again, Israel, until you say, blessed is he who comes, comes to us in the name of, guess what, which is Yahweh. In other words, he's saying, until you acknowledge that I am God, until then, your eyes, your hearts are going to be darkened and blinded. But there's coming a day when you're going to recognize who I am. And in that day is going to come in the coming of Jesus, the fulfillment of the promise that went way back to Abraham. God said, I'm going to reveal myself to you when you acknowledge who I am. Until then, you'll be scattered and your temple will be gone. What's interesting is what's happening in the world today. Because as all the prophets prophesied, there will come a time when God is going to... In fact, there, there's a... Oh, how does it describe it? I can't tell you the reference and which prophet it is even. There's a, re, there's a description of what God is doing, and it's like whistling to call a dog to himself. And he says, I'm going to do that, and you're going to come out of the nations, and you're going to come back to this land. And we're seeing that. We're seeing it in our time. Um, so the conditional aspect of the covenant that God made through Moses in what, happened, what has happened to Israel for 2,000 years now and, and a couple of times before that, it's really evident, the conditional aspect of it, but it does beg the question, what about the Abrahamic covenant? Because God said it's forever and it's unconditional. And, and there are many who say, well, what happened with the Mosaic covenant negates any covenant. Uh, I don't think that's true according to what God's Word says. And I, I think we need to really look carefully into these promises that God made. Um, because we, ha we have this tendency to kind of lump everything in the Old Testament under one old covenant and say, well, that's now past and while we're in the new covenant. And yet there was more than one and they were on different terms. Uh, so we can't really do that and be accurate to Scripture. So God told them, your possession of the land throughout history is conditional. He said that to Moses. Dependent on your remaining faithful to me. But your unfaithfulness does not negate my promise, nor my faithfulness to you. Your not living in the land doesn't change the fact that the land belongs to you. I mean, you, can, you guys know that, you who own land. You can own land and not live on it, right? That's kind of what the situation is with Israel all through most of history since 
70 AD. Uh, but God said, yeah, you're not going to live on it because you weren't faithful in what I said through Moses. But I've given you this land. So what was the perspective when you hear that? from moving forward from the time of Abraham, then the time of Moses, to the time of Jesus, and then just beyond into Paul's ministry. Interesting. What did Paul have to say about all of this is what I'm getting at. Um, and we have to remember that everything that Paul wrote, which is included in Scripture, did not originate from his own mind and heart. It was given him by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, according to the rest of as all Scripture was, the Word says. Here's what Paul wrote in Galatians 3. The law, the Mosaic Covenant, which came 430 years afterward, and he's talking about after the Abrahamic Covenant, he said the law does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance the owning of what God promised Israel. If the inheritance comes by the law, then it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham, Paul says, by a promise. Interesting, isn't it? So here we are 2,000 years removed even from Paul's life, 4,000 years removed from Abraham's life. And I think there's a tendency, as I said, to, to just categorize all of this into one lump covenant. And the natural landing zone of that perspective is that everything has become null and void due to Israel's unfaithfulness. And it's all been replaced by the new covenant, which we're going to talk about in two weeks, by the way, so I'm not going to say too much tonight. I'm not going to say any more about that tonight. The truth is, the Mosaic covenant was a covenant that lived and died with Israel because it was conditional. The promise of dwelling in their land was dependent on their faithfulness. Not of owning it, of living in it. The Abrahamic covenant was a covenant between God and Israel which incorporated its unconditional fulfillment. Within that fulfillment was incorporated what, he, what God told Abraham, a blessing which will affect all the nations of the earth. We know what that blessing is, don't we? We know who that blessing is. Through Abraham's line came Jesus. And it's only through him that we as Gentiles have been made children of Abraham and beneficiaries of the promises made to him in the same manner that Abraham received them. It says Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. In the same manner we believe him. And as Moses indicated... And as I said, as just about every other prophet whose writings are in the Bible, all of the promises that God makes are or will be fulfilled in Jesus. Whether those promises be ones he specifically made to Abraham or those that include all the nations of the earth. Um, and as far as the Mosaic Covenant and its implication for our lives today, it remains as holy as it was on the day that God gave it to Israel through Moses. And it remains as impossible for us to keep it today as it proved to be for Israel 1,500 years before Christ. And that's why Hebrews 7.19 says, The law made nothing perfect. I mean, it showed us perfection but it didn't give us the ability to live perfectly. And three verses after Hebrews 7.19 says that, it says, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant, a covenant by which God can and will look at us and see perfection, not by anything inherently a part of us, but because his perfect son lives in us. The same basis by which every human being, Jew or Gentile, must come into the fulfillment of God's promises. So the writer to the Hebrews 719 describes it this way, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Better than what? Better than trying to be accepted by God by living a good enough life by the law. And it's Jesus who is not just our better hope, well, let me rephrase that. It's Jesus who's not just our better hope. He's your only hope. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are always faithful, that you never forget what you have proclaimed. 
And Lord, we allow circumstances in our lives to cause us to move on from something that we should never move on from sometimes. But you didn't allow that in your, in your dealing with this world and with the people of it. So thank you that you remember. Thank you that you are merciful. And thank you, Lord, that even though your judgments are severe, your love, your loving kindness, your grace is more powerful still. And it's in that grace that we stand tonight because of Jesus. Amen.